Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to talk to you, man. I've been a big fan. Um, Thank kinda, you so uh, much. Yeah, man. Uh, I kind of like the way you uh, worked your way into the business and uh, and uh, didn't let it didn't let anything stop you into getting into it, man. And uh, and then finally doing your thing with arbitrage, which I thought was amazing. Thank uh, you. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks a lot. I haven't had a white collar story like that uh, grip me the way that one has uh, in a while. In a while, honestly. So that was that was great. Um, but let's talk about crisis. Um, what uh, the opioid crisis? Obviously, huge deal in the country. Um, a lot of movies coming out about it right now too. Um, what what made you want to tell this particular story about the opioid crisis? Well, really, Travis, it started um, it started with personal experience, um, as these things often do. Uh, I had a friend many years ago that I lost to opioids. Mm. And uh, at the time, so little was known about it. It was very confusing because, oh, this is such a bright young guy. What happened? Mm. Um, you know, and he had gotten started with the, the pills, uh, no big deal. And then all of a sudden became very dependent and money runs out and you go over to heroin. And, you know, boy, it's hard to come back from that. So I think at the time, very little was known about these issues. And then we saw over the last decade, really an explosion in, uh, in addiction and uh, in people having problems with opioids. So, you know, it was kind of like, huh, what, what, how did this all come out? And then, so I started to do research. And what I learned is I hooked up with some reporters at the LA Times, and I hooked up with these undercover sheriff uh, department folks uh, from LA who had busted a bunch of cartels making, you know, fake fentanyl or fentanyl, real fentanyl. Uh, and, um, you know, it was, oh, well, like, just like the white collar thing, follow the money, you know, so they're opioid manufacturers and if they can get a patent and now put this out and well, oh, is there research that shows a, a lot of people who take it get addicted instantly? Yeah, but I mean, is that really good research? You know, so we explore right. that with Oldman's character in the film. Um, and you see it sort of in the same vein as arbitrage, the profit motive takes over and kind of the wheels come off the train. And, um, and so I just thought, you know, people really need to know about this. And by the way, it's great fodder for a thriller because I think, you know, uh, and it sounds like the kind of films you like, you know, I don't like the films that are, you know, oh, here, eat your vegetables. Uh, here's a lesson for you. <laughs> you know, that's who wants to see that. I got, yeah. I got enough of that in my daily. So, uh, you know, here was really, well, let's present something. Let's look at it from all sides and, and try to give the audience the information it needs to make a decision about what needs to be done. I have my own views, you know, which is um, activism, uh, you know, treatment, understanding that people with drug problems are not bad people. They're, right. you know, people with a disease or pe and, and in the case of certain pharmaceutical, people who've been actively marketed to and recruited into this nightmare of pain. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's just really, uh, let's look at this together as a society and figure out what we want to do. And I think you're seeing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of that coming down now. It's interesting because uh, you, you do take such a, a multi-tiered approach to it. Um, and I was, when I was watching it, I was like, any of these individual stories could probably make a compelling, a compelling thriller on their own. As in particular, the, the Oldman piece, I was like, man, this could be an, an arbitrage style personal drama right here too. Like if he wanted to, was there any thought to making like individual stories or was it always like you want to do this all encompassing thing? Well, I thought, you know, the issue is really quite complex. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to kind of give, uh, you know, an overview of all sides. So we have Oldman in the pharmaceutical fight. He's the whistleblower. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, Jake, the undercover detective uh, who's fighting, you know, cartels and illicit smuggling. And then we have Evangeline's character, Claire, as, uh, uh, you know, a person who's affected by it. Um, a recovering addict and someone who becomes kind of a detective in terms of what happened to her son. So I just thought, you know, we could look at the personal, the crime and the uh, corporate um, and that that would be a nice, uh, a nice multifaceted look, you know, because keep in mind, you know, now there's a few opioid films coming together, still not a lot, but you know, nothing's been done. This is the first film on the topic. So uh, we really haven't seen anything. And I thought, you know, Soderbergh had done it so well with traffic um, in exploring the cocaine issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I always love these multi-plot films, 21 Grams, Babel, yeah. LA Confidential, you know, there, I guess maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a value shopper, 
So it's like, if I go see a movie, I was like, hey, give me a lot. Don't give me a little. Uh, <laughs> it might know. be a good idea for right now. People get to see so few movies. Why not give them a few at once, right? Give them a few once. And Ben, by the way, you get to work with so many great actors. And I love actors and I'm really stimulated by them. So, um, you know, it's just kind of uh, more the merrier, uh, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, you have a, a fantastic group in this one. You mentioned Old Man uh, Hammer, uh, Evangeline Lilly, but even beyond that, Greg Kinnear and so forth. Uh, it's a it's a, a embarrassment of riches, man. Talk to me about how you're able to put this together. This is an incredible group. Uh, well, thank Lilly. you. I, I agree. You know, really fine actors overall. You know, Lily Depp, Michelle Rodriguez, Luke Evans. Um, I started with Gary Oldman. I had met him. I was a big fan Where's of Darkest start? Hour. Um, yeah, and we we got introduced, and um, we were talking about something else. And then I had written the first draft of the script, and I gave it to me. He said, you know, look, this is really where it's at. We should do this right away. Um, I've got an opening. And then he came on board as an executive producer and really allowed me to use his name to go around and attract other other people. So Evangeline Lilly, I'd always loved from Lost. Um, you know, she was such a, had shown so many sides of her ability to perform. Um, and then, you know, from there, it was really just calling folks. Like I was friends with Michelle Rodriguez. Greg Kinnear has been a family friend for many years. Um, Luke Evans, I didn't know. Lily Depp, I knew for socially from LA. And I was calling everybody, hey, I got no money. Would you like to come to Montreal where it's freezing? But listen, it's for a good cause. And I think you can create a great character. And so to their credit, they did. Um, you know, and we did a lot of rehearsal, which was really fun. And that's always exploring the character. I, I like to take the actor's input, incorporate it into the script, revise it. Um, you know, so you get a sense of a round character. I think you see even with Lily, uh, Lily Rose Depp, you know, she's, she's only in a handful of scenes, but boy, she makes an impression on you, you know, and that's a testament to her research and her capabilities as an actress. Um, so, uh, so it was just great fun. You talked a little bit, uh, just mentioned the, you know, having no money. It's a quite a sprawling effort though, for a movie that you, like you said, is, is a low budget. How, what were some of the challenges you faced in, in, uh, in putting that together? I mean, what weren't the challenges? <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, we're shooting action. We're shooting in a foreign country. We're shooting on 35 millimeter because I love 35 and I, I felt it was the appropriate thing for this story. Um, and, and we're doing it in the cold. Um, so, and, and we're doing it with a budget that's, you know, a fifth of a normal studio budget. But I think where there's a will, there's a way, you know. So I worked in Canada, uh, in Montreal. They have an incredible artisanal, uh, crew there, you know, they have their own film industry, but then they service Hollywood. So I had a bunch of the same crew, you know, my friend Lee Daniels, he just did uh, uh, Billy Holiday up there, um, you know, with a lot of the same folks I used. Mm. And they are, they bring it, they're dedicated, they're nimble, they know how to shoot. I had a wonderful cinematographer, Nicola Balduc on this picture, you know, and we would take, you know, 30 shots a day sometimes. I mean, we just jammed and jammed. He had an incredible G&E grip and electric crew, you know, uh, you know, the Yves Gagnon, David, uh, you know, they would, they would just push themselves because they treated it like it was their movie. My father came to visit the set and I, you know, I was telling him I was very happy with the crew and he said, you know, there's an old story. One guy sees another guy, he's moving a brick, you know, from this place to that place. And he says, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm moving a brick from here to there. And he asks another worker, what are you doing? He says, I'm building the Sistine Chapel, you know? And that was the approach that this crew took. They were building the Sistine Chapel. So they yeah. put their blood, sweat and tears into it. The actors were there and, and you just make it happen. You know, uh, you make it happen. You cut this deal and that deal, go back and negotiate with the guy. Oh, I'm gonna pull it over here. You know, you play all the games you can play. I'm on the phone calling Kodak. I need free film, I'm running out of film, you know, whatever. But, but people supported the topic and they supported the mission. I uh, mentioned Arbitrage earlier is a movie that, like I said, I really love. Uh, it's been a little while since that film, though. What have you been doing kind of in between? Was it just uh, research on this film, development and things like that? Or were you just what? Yeah, just a lot of vacation. No, um, you know, the uh, uh, I mean, look, the thing with Hollywood is, you know, we're 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 making films here, our little group. I mean, these are not easily financeable slam dunk films. You know, they're they're risky and they confront uh, darker elements of society. And I think, you know, some of them offend, may offend the powers that be. Um, so getting financing for these films, pulling these together is quite challenging. You know, uh, I, 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 I've been, been writing and I've worked on a number of projects, things that are brewing up to the surface now. But, you know, to get these kind of films done, you know, there's a moment for them and you kind of, everything has to come through the eye of the needle. Um, and so it's almost a miracle when they occur. Uh, so I'm very thankful that this one came together. I definitely like to get back in action sooner. And I, I saw your support of me as a filmmaker and I appreciate that. So it's, it's not for lack of desire. 
Um, you know, it's more, uh, how do you find the opportunity? Uh, your, your movies so far, the, the impression I'm getting is that you like focusing on a societal issue and making them personal. That's the way I felt about your, your, your the two films you've done so far. Is there another sort of topic that you're, that you're wanting to tackle next? Uh, and sort of in the same lines as your, as your first two films. Yeah, I mean, I think I really like, you know, like Sidney Lumet did this or Catherine Bigelow did this, films that look at institutional dysfunction or societal dysfunction, you know, something that just isn't right. And I particularly like looking at it, why isn't it right, you know, and uh, it's oftentimes money or it's oftentimes an entrenched culture. So I'm working on a project now about a brilliant woman, a true story, a woman in the military who was a helicopter pilot and she you know, changed all the laws so women could serve in combat, you know, and it's like the, the, the institutional dysfunction she fought in the military uh, of trying to be a patriotic citizen who wanted to serve in combat and was prohibited from serving in combat because of some insane antiquated rules. Um, so she had to break the rules, change the system and ultimately succeeded. So I love stories like that. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I love peeling back a layer and trying to understand what's happening. You know, we live under so many rules that we don't even know are there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, we have personal liberty. We enjoy these incredible freedoms, but we need to exercise ourselves to, to fight for the things that we think are, we are entitled to as patriotic citizens um, to not be killed by uh, the profit motive of corporations <laughs> to uh, not uh, you know, let the bosses on Wall Street take us into financial ruin so that they can pay for another mansion and to let our, our men and women in the armed forces serve us equally um, and to recognize opportunity where lay. So I love stuff like that, but look, at the same time, it's gotta be fun. You know, it's gotta be French Connection. It's gotta be Zero Dark Thirty. It's gotta be an adventure cinematically yeah. because that's what this art form is built for. You know, otherwise, let's read a story in The New Yorker uh, or, you know, th th this is about taking you on a ride emotionally. Yeah, I, I, I like that your movie isn't just a Wikipedia entry about the opioid crisis, which is what, you know, some a lot of these movies uh, tend to fall back on by, you know, not intentionally, but uh, I think that just they're so hung up on the points and the data and stuff like that that they forget to tell a story. Uh, it's something that you've not had a problem with in your first couple of movies, and I, I appreciate that. Well, thank uh, you. There was a famous studio executive named Harry Cohn back in the day, and he's noted for saying, if you want to send a message, call Western Union. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good point, and I think a good place to end on, man. Uh, th thanks a lot, Nicholas, man. I really love this, and um, I, appreciate, I appreciate what you do, and uh, I look forward to what you do next, man. Good luck with the film. Thank you, Travis. I appreciate your support. All right. Thanks a lot, man. Have a good one. Okay. Be safe.